Hello, my name is Hugh Jones and I'm a lecturer in film at the University of Southampton. In this video, I'm going to give you a taste of what it's like to study film at Southampton. Here at Southampton, we study film in three broad ways. Film as an art form, film as an industry, and film as a cultural and historical artefact. In this video lecture, I want to use these three approaches to explore a set of films I hope you're already familiar with, the James Bond film franchise. This is a topic I cover in my second year module Contemporary British Filmmakers. It's also an example of the kind of research-led teaching we do here at Southampton. I'm going to bring in some of my own research findings on the transnational appeal of the most recent Bond films starring Daniel Craig as Agent 007. The lecture lasts about 20 minutes, but I'm going to give you some questions to think about along the way. So it might help to have a pen and paper with you to note down your responses to these questions. Remember, you can pause the video at any time or rewind it if there's anything you want to see or hear again. Let's begin by looking at the business of Bond. The Bond films are one of the most successful film franchises ever. Since the first Bond film, Doctor No, was released in 1962, the 25 Bond films have made almost 8 billion US dollars through cinema ticket sales alone. And that doesn't include additional revenue from DVD, video on demand or TV sales. The most recent Bond film, No Time to Die, has so far taken 762 million US dollars at the global box office. This is about 110 million less than Spectre in 2015, but still pretty good considering it was released in the midst of a global pandemic when many cinemas were shut or being avoided by vulnerable groups. According to the American Statistical Association, 20% of the world's population have seen at least one Bond film. This brings us to our first question. Why do you think the Bond film franchise has been so globally successful? Pause the video now and list some of the reasons why you think the Bond films have been so popular with audiences across the globe for such a long period of time. According to Bond historian James Chapman, there are four key reasons why Bond is so successful. First, he suggests it has something to do with the film's high quality production values. People may argue about the relative merits of the Bond films, wrote producer Cubby Broccoli, the man responsible for bringing Bond to cinema screens in the 1960s, but few would deny that they reveal the highest production values and technical skills. The most recent Bond films on average cost 200 million US dollars to make, and both Casino Royale and Skyfall won major prizes for their production design. Second, Chapman argues that audiences are attracted to the film's spectacular visual qualities, particularly its fast-paced action, dramatic stunts and special effects. Think, for example, of the free-running chase scene across the rooftops and building sites of the Madagascan capital in the opening sequence of Casino Royale, or Bond's extended fistfight with the mercenary Patrice on top of a speeding train at the start of Skyfall. As another Bond scholar notes, this assures them a large international audience because they're able to bypass language and cultural barriers and appeal directly to people of various nationalities and age groups. Third, Chapman claims that Bond's Britishness is a key part of his appeal. This serves as a means of differentiating Bond from the all-American action heroes incarnated by the likes of Bruce Willis and Sylvester Stallone. At the same time, Chapman notes Bond is not parochially British. He's very much the Englishman abroad, a professional tourist whose job takes him to exotic foreign locations. In Skyfall, for example, we see lots of British symbols, such as here at the end of the film, where Bond stands on the rooftop of the MI6 building, overlooking the Houses of Parliament. 
Yet we also see Bond visiting places like Turkey, Bali and China. Lastly, and most importantly for Chapman, is the ability of the Bond film producers to find the right balance between continuity and change. Each film provides elements which audiences expect to see. Car chases, returning characters like Q and M, and an evil genius villain whose plans for world domination Bond must thwart. At the same time, the technology, the conflicts and even the jokes are constantly being updated to keep pace with changing tastes and attitudes. This brings us to our next question. What are the key characteristics of a Bond film? Pause the video now and make a list. And also note if any of these elements have been updated in the most recent Bond films starring Daniel Craig as Agent 007. Here are some of the key elements you might expect to find in a Bond film. The Bond girls, the megalomaniac villain, a bizarre array of henchmen, exotic locations, the expensive ingeniously enhanced cars, lengthy chases involving anything from speedboats to tanks, and various imprisonment escape scenarios frequently involving piranhas, sharks or alligators. We might also include on that list things like the Bond theme tune, phrases like shaken not stirred or licensed to kill, and a cast of returning characters like Q, M, Miss Moneypenny and Felix Leiter, Bond's CIA counterpart. But as we've already heard, these elements are constantly being updated to keep pace with changing tastes and attitudes. My own research has looked at how the most recent Bond films starring Daniel Craig as Agent 007 have been rebooted for 21st century audiences. With Die Another Day, the final film to star Piers Brosnan in the role of 007, ending with Bond surfing a tsunami, there was a sense that the Bond films had become a bit overblown around the turn of the millennium. Comedies like Austin Powers and Johnny English frequently lampooned the spy genre and the Bond franchise in particular. So when Bond returned to cinema screens in 2006 with Casino Royale starring Daniel Craig as the new 007, the film started to adopt a more serious and realistic tone, perhaps inspired by the hugely successful Jason Bourne films directed by the former journalist and documentary filmmaker Paul Greengrass. Compared with his predecessors, Craig's Bond was a far more complex character, both physically and psychologically damaged by his job as a cold-blooded assassin. Other characters received a makeover too. Take Q, the MI6 quartermaster, who supplies Bond with the gadgets he needs to complete his missions. In the early Bond films, Q, played by actor Desmond Llewellyn, conformed to the stereotype of the ageing and slightly eccentric white-coated laboratory boffin. But in Skyfall, Q returns as a much younger character played by actor Ben Whishlaw. In the age of teenage computer hackers and billionaire web designers who are barely old enough to vote, Whishlaw's renewal of Q as a boyish computer geek provided a much more apt depiction of the 21st century technical wizard. These changes in the Bond franchise allow us to see how the films relate to the wider society in which they were produced. In other words, we can think about the Bond films as cultural and historical artefacts that tell us about the cultures and periods from which they arise. The original Bond novels, written by Ian Fleming between 1955 and 1963, were published at a time when Britain was beginning to lose its place in the world. The Suez Crisis of 1956, when America forced Britain to withdraw its troops from Egypt, signified the end of Britain's role as a major world power. Fleming's novels lament Britain's crumbling empire, while still suggesting that Britain is a power to be reckoned with. America may have the money, weapons and bluster, but Bond has the wit, brains and charm to match. At the same time, Bond's adventures portray a world of conspicuous consumption, which in the late 1950s and early 1960s, many Britons now felt was in their reach. 
Bond's jet-setting adventures took him to the best hotels, restaurants and beaches in the world at a time when many ordinary Britons were getting their first taste of overseas holidays and foreign food. Likewise, Bond's use of technological gadgetry to thwart villains appealed to millions eagerly consuming the latest labour-saving devices such as vacuum cleaners and washing machines. The Bond films also reveal change in attitudes towards gender. In the early Bond films of the 1960s and 70s, female characters had little individual agency. With a few exceptions, they seem to exemplify Laura Mulvey's claim that in most Hollywood films, women are sex objects merely to be looked at by men. But as women have gained more equality and autonomy within society, the female characters in the Bond films have begun to play more assertive roles. Take Miss Moneypenny. In the early Bond films, Miss Moneypenny is a desk-bound secretary who flirts with Bond before his mission briefings at MI6's London headquarters. But in the more recent Bond films, Miss Moneypenny plays an active field agent who accompanies Bond on one of his overseas missions. Bond's boss, M, is also a woman apparently modelled on Stella Remington, the former chief of MI5. Yet for some critics, these changes do not go far enough. Bond remains, as Judy Dench's M tells Piers Brosnan's Bond in 1995's GoldenEye. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. This has led to calls for the next Bond to be black, gay or even a woman. There's no such thing as a black Bond. It's just, are we interested in having a, char a Bond character other than being a male? It could be a woman. Could be a black woman, could be a white woman. But, you know, I think that character, everybody would like to see it have, uh, you know, do, do something different with it. Why not? Film scholars have entered this debate. In a recent column for the online newspaper The Conversation, Dr Shelley Cobb, a film lecturer here at Southampton, made the case for a female bond. Having a woman, and a woman of colour especially, take on the role might give the franchise a chance to expose the silliness of thinking that Bond represents the zeitgeist of what's considered desirable and admirable in a man at any given moment, she wrote. A female Bond might reinvigorate the franchise, or she might kill the Bond icon. Either way, it's better to be fearless. Arguing against this position was Bond historian James Chapman, who felt that Bond is an icon of popular culture and shouldn't be messed with. You wouldn't turn Indiana Jones or Luke Skywalker into a woman any more than you'd want a male Bridget Jones, he wrote. We don't need to turn James Bond into a woman, instead we just need similar films with female leads. This brings us to our next question. Take a look at Shelley Cobb's and James Chapman's columns in The Conversation. You can find a link in the slide. Which of their arguments do you find most persuasive and why? And here's another question for you to think about. If there were to be a female Bond, who would you cast in that role and why? Pause the video now to write down your answers to these questions. We may not see a female Bond anytime soon, but the impact of this debate is certainly being felt beyond the university seminar room. Over recent years, we've seen a growing number of Hollywood action films with women in strong lead roles. From Charlize Theron as an MI6 agent on the hunt for double agents in Atomic Blonde, to Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman and Brie Larson as Captain Marvel, film producers are beginning to realise there's a large and previously untapped audience for female superheroes. For the latest Bond film, No Time to Die, Lashana Lynch was cast as 007, taking over Bond's secret agent number after his character leaves MI6. Meanwhile, Fleabag and Killing Eve auteur Phoebe Waller-Bridge was brought onto the Bond writing team, saying explicitly that her focus was to make sure the franchise treats women properly. It's yet another example of the Bond franchise constantly being updated to keep pace with changing tastes and cultural attitudes. Having looked at Bond as an industry, as well as as a cultural and historical artefact, the final way we can approach the Bond films is as an art form. It may seem strange to describe Bond as art, 
a term usually reserved for more art house films or experimental works rather than blockbuster action movies. But regardless of whether we think the Bond films are artistically good or bad, they nevertheless involve creative decisions about what we see and hear on screen. One of the skills you learn during the first year of your film degree is how to analyse these creative decisions to understand how films create aesthetic experiences, to make us think and feel. In this final exercise, we're going to analyse a scene from Skyfall. This is the scene where M, the head of MI6, is called before a parliamentary inquiry in which she has to make the case for the continued relevance of her shadowy organisation. The inquiry is dramatically interrupted when Bond's nemesis, Raoul Silver, who has escaped from MI6 custody, bursts into the courtroom disguised as a police officer in an attempt to assassinate M. Meanwhile, Bond is running across London to stop Silver, but will he make it on time? I want you to watch this scene several times. The first time, just make a note of what you're thinking or feeling whilst watching the scene. Do you feel tense or excited, curious or amused? Then watch the scene again, but this time pay close attention to the following elements. Firstly, the mise-en-scene, that's everything we see in front of the camera, the setting or the location of the scene, the lighting of the scene, where the actors are positioned on the stage, their performance, their costumes, their props. Secondly, the cinematography, that's how the film is shot or filmed. The angle, the level, the height, the distance and the movement of the camera. Thirdly, the sound, everything we can hear, the music and dialogue, which can either be diegetic, that is in the film's world, or non-diegetic, that is outside the film's world. Finally, the editing, how the images are cut together. Are the different shots showing events happening at the same time and in the same location, what filmmakers call continuous editing, or are we jumping to different time periods and locations known as discontinuous editing? Think about how all these elements are working together to create that mood or feeling you identified the first time you watched the scene. Also assume that nothing you see or hear in the sequence is accidental. Chairman, Ministers, today I've repeatedly heard how irrelevant my department has become. Why do we need agents, the double O section? Isn't it all rather quaint? Well, I suppose I see a different world than you do. And the truth is that what I see frightens me. I'm frightened because our enemies are no longer known to us. They do not exist on a map. They're not nations. They are individuals. But look around you. Who do you fear? Can you see a face, a uniform, a flag? No. Our world is not more transparent now. It's more opaque. It's in the shadows. That's where we must do battle. So before you declare us irrelevant, ask yourselves, how safe do you feel? Just one more thing to say. My late husband was a great lover of poetry, and um, I suppose some of it sunk in, despite my best intentions. And here today, I remember this, I think, from Tennyson. We are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are one equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So what did you think? How did the scene make you feel? 
And how do the different elements, the mise-en-scene, the cinematography, the sound and the editing work together to create that mood or feeling? If you need to, rewind the video and watch the scene again. The more times you watch the scene, the more things you'll begin to notice. This close textual analysis is a key skill for film students. Here's my own take on the scene. The camera starts on the London Underground sign, immediately giving away the scene's location, then pans down to Raoul Silva emerging from the station. He's dressed in a police uniform, but his posture looks menacing and dangerous as he enters the waiting police car. We hear M's voice beginning to speak before the parliamentary inquiry, but the camera is still focused on Silva. He's handling the gun. We immediately know M is on his mind and he's coming to kill her. The camera then cuts to the parliamentary inquiry. M is talking about being frightened by enemies no longer known to us. And immediately there's a shot of Silva, one of those unknown enemies. Notice how the camera is cutting between two different locations, the parliamentary inquiry and the police car, but the action is taking place at the same time. M is static but Silva is moving. We know he's coming to kill her. This is an example of parallel editing. It seems like a very obvious technique, but when parallel editing was first developed by Edwin S. Porter for the silent film The Great Train Robbery of 1903, it marked a huge breakthrough in the language of cinema. The tension is underlined by the non-diegetic soundtrack. The strings echo the sound of a heart monitor. There's also a low rhythm track that sounds like a fast-paced heartbeat. My late was a great Our own heart rate begins to quicken. And, um, Meanwhile, you can hear the faint sound of a ticking in. clock. My best Time is running out for M. And here today, I remember this. I think Suddenly the music begins to swell and shift from a dark minor to a light major key we as our hero James Bond emerges from the tube station. Which in old days moved earth now the action is cutting between three locations, M in the parliamentary are, inquiry, Silver walking towards One the parliamentary building and Bond cars. running down the street. Made weak Notice how each of the main characters, the hero, the and villain fate. and the victim, are framed at the, the centre of the camera. This emphasises their significance to, to the plot. To find the sound of Silver bursting into the parliamentary inquiry room is emphasised by a loud bang. The volume of the gunshots is amplified to increase the shock value. His mental anguish is underlined by the cacophony of strings and screams. Will he shoot M? Will M survive? That brings us to the end of our lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've learned something new. If you've got any questions about studying film at Southampton, you can visit our website. If you want to learn more about studying film at Southampton, visit our website at www.southampton.com dot ac dot uk forward slash film